All right, what's up amigos? Now we have another aerodynamic fundamental video on the Reynolds number. So we're going to be covering what is the Reynolds number, why do we use it, and the limitations. So you've probably heard it about a million times by now. So maybe you understand what it is a little bit or maybe not at all. So we're gonna go through all these aspects so you understand it well. So first up, what is the Reynolds number? So the Reynolds number is something called a non-dimensional number. And the equation is quite simple. I'm gonna write the equation first because it will help us understand a little bit easier what it is. And I'll write the equation first and then explain what it is. So we have two forms. We have the first form. This is the density, rho, times the velocity, u, times the length scale, l, divided by the dynamic viscosity, which is mu. This is also equal to the velocity, u, times by the length scale, l, times by the kinematic viscosity, nu. So you'll notice that these two equations are very similar. The only difference is there's a, another term here on top, and the term on the bottom is a little bit different. So just know that these two terms are actually equivalent. So nu equals u mu on rho. So what does this equation mean, or these two different forms of the same equation? Well, on top we have, so these top terms, regardless of which form you have, they both indicate the inertial forces. The bottom terms, regardless of which form you have, dictate the viscous forces. So this equation is literally just a balance between the inertial forces and the viscous forces. So if we have the Reynolds number equal to well above one, we can see that the inertial forces are now going to be much greater than the viscous forces, which means that that's going to dominate the flow. If the Reynolds number is significantly below one, we can then conclude that the bottom line has to be much bigger. Otherwise we wouldn't get one, we'd have like above one. So if the Reynolds number is well below one, we can say that the viscous forces are dominating the flow. So what does this mean from a practical sense of, uh, point of view? So let's say we have an object, just a, a regular cylinder, and we have the flow going over it at a free stream velocity of u infinity, and the flow comes around. Now, one characteristic property of a cylinder's wake is that we get something called a von Kármán street, which is where we just have a roll up of vortices. And they are opposite signs, one from one side, one from the other. Now, in terms of the Reynolds number, how does this apply to this situation or any situation which is similar? So if we have a very small Reynolds number, this means that the viscous forces in the flow are far outweighing the inertial forces. So this means that all these vortices which have inertia to them because they have mass, it is fluid, it is air or liquid, um, water, honey, whatever, uh, rotating around, there is inertia to it. All these inertial forces, if the Reynolds number is very low, mean that the viscosity is actually tearing these vortices apart much quicker. So these, these vortices are not going to propagate downstream nearly as much as if the Reynolds number is very high. The reason why is because if the Reynolds number is very high, it means that the viscous forces are still there. We still have kinematic and dynamic viscosities in these two denominators, but the inertial forces are now so much greater that these uh, vortices or whatever flow structure we have is now just blowing through the viscosity and it can propagate well downstream. Now this has major implications, not just for wakes, but for boundary layers. I did a video on boundary layer fundamentals uh, not long ago, so if you can find that in the description below. But let's talk about how the Reynolds number affects boundary layers as well and just wakes in general. So let's say we have one object, one cylinder upstream and another cylinder downstream. These are very simple objects, that's why I'm using these two ideas. So we have the flow going around and again we have the wake forming. If we have the Reynolds number is very low, by the time we get to the second cylinder, these vortices will now die out. So this cylinder will now see much cleaner flow. That's very important because this cylinder, depending on what the upstream flow is, will have a very different wake structure. If the Reynolds number is very high, so let's say 10,000, 100,000, a million, a billion, over 9,000, then the vortices will 
propagate further downstream and they'll actually start hitting this second cylinder. That means that this wake structure is not going to be nearly as well behaved as this second one. So this, than the first one, sorry. So this first wake structure is periodic. So we have these vortices coming off in a very coherent manner, we call it. This second cylinder will not be able to produce this coherent structure because these original wake structures from the first cylinder are now messing up the flow going over the second cylinder. So we're just gonna have some craziness. We're gonna probably have some vortices, but they're not gonna be nearly as well behaved, as well structured. Over a boundary layer, so a, a surface, we have a boundary layer forming. If we have the velocity profile, which you will know what this is from our other video, if we have a very low Reynolds number, as the flow continues to going over the surface, it won't develop into a turbulent boundary layer. This will still stay laminar. However, if we have a very high Reynolds number, as we go along, the boundary layer will then start to transition to a turbulent boundary layer. Why is this? Well, the reason is because, again, the Reynolds number is the relationship between the inertial forces and the viscous forces. So if we have a very high Reynolds number, it means that the inertial forces are very high. So any small disturbances in this boundary layer will start to propagate downstream. It will still be present and they'll start to grow. They'll, and then they'll result in this turbulent boundary layer forming because turbulence is nothing other than really um, unstructured energy just coming out in all different ways. Laminar boundary layers are well-behaved flow. So the energy is um, well determined and, and it's not really misbehaving. So that's what the Reynolds number is, and how, why do we use it? We have some examples here, but there are even more uses. That's why the Reynolds number is so common and so popular. So let's say I'm a researcher and I'm doing research on cylinders. So I have looked at one cylinder and I've tested it and I've found that the vortices coming off of it come off at a frequency of two hertz. Uh, has a strong number of 0 0.21, let's say, which is another property that I'm not going to discuss here. This is just another fundamental idea. But let's say I publish my research and another researcher on the other side of the world gets it and he or she is looking at it and going, okay, well, I want to reproduce these experiments. How do I do that? What size cylinder is it? What flow is it? Speed is it? Etc. So let's say I give that information to this researcher. But still, maybe this researcher doesn't have the ability to conduct this experiment under the same conditions. Maybe the wind tunnel doesn't go up to the same speed or maybe it's not big enough or whatever. So we can then use the Reynolds number to, call, to ensure something called similarity. So let's say the wind tunnel can only accommodate a cylinder which is only one tenth the size. That's, that's okay, as long as we have the same Reynolds number. So let's say my Reynolds number was 100 to begin with, if their velocity is now, if their size, sorry, the characteristic length is one tenth, the velocity has to go up by a factor of 10 to keep a Reynolds number of 100, that's fine. So why would we want to make sure the Reynolds number is the same? Again, it comes back to the inertial versus the viscous forces. If the Reynolds number is different, it means that the inertial forces will play more or less of a role in the, not only the wake formation, but also the boundary layer formation. If they have the same ratio, it means that they will get the same kind of wake structures forming. So that's why we want to keep the Reynolds number the same. This ensures something called similarity. And we can do similarity among a whole bunch of different properties, not just Reynolds number, but we can do the Struhl number, which I mentioned earlier, or whatever else. So that's why we use the Reynolds number. It gives us a way of comparing two different objects that look very different, but fundamentally are the same. So again, we could have different um, objects as well. We can have a square and we can have a cylinder. Now these look like very different objects, but fundamentally we can reduce them down to their Reynolds number. So as long as we have the same Reynolds number for both of them, we can compare them and see what the different wakes are. If we have different Reynolds numbers, then it's not only the shape that's affecting the flow, but also the different properties. So the density, uh, velocity, length scale, and viscosities. So we want to keep the Reynolds numbers constant. I want to talk about the length scale a little bit because this is a very important parameter which is not talked about nearly enough. So what is the length scale? I have, let's say I have a flat plate. So I have a flat plate like this and it has a certain amount of thickness to it. So we have a width of A 
a length of B and a thickness of C. What length scale do I choose? The length scale is the, is the characteristic length of the object, whether that is A, B or C. Well, this really depends on what I want to find. So traditionally in boundary layer studies, we would take B. And the reason why that is, is because boundary layers form over the distance of objects like this and this on the left and our other video. If I wanted to figure out what the effects of the thickness are on the flow, so let's say I have a really thick uh, plate, then I would take C to be the characteristic length. If I wanted to figure out what the width is for a certain reason, I would take A. So how do we express this in the Reynolds number? We would then write the Reynolds number and calculate it as rho u a divided by mu or rho u b divided by mu or rho u c divided by u, depending on what we are doing. And we would then ideally write a subscript to indicate to the reader that we are using that length scale. Now, ideally we do do this, sometimes we don't, we just say Reynolds number and that is fine in fields where um, everyone uses the exact same length scale, but when there is some ambiguity, we should always put this subscript so everyone knows what we're talking about. So that's what a Reynolds number is, what, why do we use it? Now let's move on to the limitations, and this is something that we don't really go through very often, like in university undergrad courses, you won't go through this very much, but it's very important. So the Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces, and this gives us a good idea as to what the flow is doing. But it's not the be all and it's not the end all. It's not the word of God. There are other properties that are as equally important, but we don't talk about. One is called the turbulence intensity. Or shortened to TI. The other one is surface roughness. So both of these properties affect the flow equally as much, arguably, as the Reynolds number. Let me explain why. So coming back to this situation here, we have these two cylinders. Remember how I mentioned, if we have a very high Reynolds number, the flow going over the first cylinder will produce a wake which will be so large and will propagate so much downstream that it'll hit the second cylinder and then this second cylinder's wake will not look like the first because the upstream conditions that it was experiencing were very different. Well, what is the difference between having a very a cylinder upstream which is creating a wake and just having a very um, variable flow to begin with? Nothing. So this is where the turbulence intensity comes into it. The turbulence intensity is a measure of how much the flow varies upstream. So if you have a turbulence intensity of 10%, it means that the velocity of the flow is fluctuating 10%. So it could be, let's say the free stream velocity on average is 10 meters per second. It could fluctuate between nine meters and 11 meters per second. So that's a major fluctuation, which effectively is equivalent to a wake in, in some respects. So that's going to change this cylinder's um, wake and flow physics just naturally. You don't even need this cylinder here. You just have a really turbulent flow to begin with, a really high terms intensity, and you're gonna get the same properties occurring. So this has nothing to do with the Reynolds number by itself, but they do, they are related in terms of, if you have a high Reynolds number, you can only get a laminar flow if you have a very low terms intensity, because that means that the flow to begin with was very well behaved. It was very close to just a one number. If you have a very low Reynolds number, the only way to get a very high turbulence, to get a turbulence um, forming, is to have a very high terms intensity level. So there's a third property though, the surface roughness. So the surface rough, so again, I should mention that this is a very comp a very advanced topic. Again, we don't really learn it in undergrad, but um, I hope you appreciate the importance of it and why we're going through it. So the third aspect is the surface roughness. And this again, links into the terms intensity level and the Reynolds number. So let's say we have this plane here. I mentioned that if you have a long enough plane, the flow will go from laminar to turbulent, the boundary layer, eventually. If you have a very ter high turbulence intensity level, the distance that it takes for it to go from laminar to turbulence will reduce. Now, if you have a very rough surface, that distance will shorten even more because if you have a very rough surface, 
this surface is creating all these tiny little vortices and all this random action that will then propagate into the boundary layer and break down into turbulence and then this will create a turbulent boundary layer. So now we have a three-way um, interaction here between the Reynolds number, the thermal density level and the surface roughness. Increasing any one of these three will result in a more turbulent boundary layer or more turbulent flow. Reducing any one of these three will result in a more lambda flow. So there's a, uh, a balance going on here. Just quoting the Reynolds number is not enough to completely describe the flow. Just like just quoting the thermal density level or the surface roughness is not enough or just quoting either any two of these. Quoting all three of them is really a um, more fundamental way of looking at the flow and it really pins down what the flow is doing. So to recap this video, we looked at the Reynolds number, we looked at what it is, which is fundamentally just how much a flow structure will propagate downstream. We have vortices down here. If we have a higher Reynolds number, these vortices will propagate downstream much more and create a lot more turbulence than if we have a low Reynolds number. If we have a low Reynolds number, it means the viscous forces are dominating the flow and these vortices will then get ripped apart very quickly. And by the time we get downstream a little bit, it will just be, again, very smooth flow. Why do we use the Reynolds number? Again, it gives us a good idea as to whether the wake and the flow over the structure is dominated by the inertial or the viscous forces, which tells us whether the flow is well behaved or not well behaved and what we can expect downstream and what we can expect over the surface as well. What are some limitations? Some limitations are that the Reynolds number is not the be-all and end-all. There are other properties that affect the wakes and the flow over a surface. For example, the thermal density level and the surface roughness. So that's it in this video. Make sure to like, subscribe. And if you want to get better at theory yourself, check out our courses in the link description. And if you want to get better at CFD yourself, check out our courses as well. And if you want to make your experiments, if you're doing experiments, if you want to make them two to four percent more accurate, check out the MSU Hawk. It's an instrument we make to accurately measure the density of air. The reason why is because the density of air changes every day by two to four percent, at least. Between days, weeks, seasons, months, the density of air changes even more. Up to 15% is quite normal. So what this means is, for example, let's say the Reynolds number, if we have a changing density, obviously the Reynolds number is going to be different. So if we go into our wind tunnel today and we are testing this cylinder at a Reynolds number of 100, we come back and even, even in a few hours, let's say, the density is different, it changes. So the Reynolds number is no longer 100. It could be 95, it could be 105, I don't know. We don't know what the density of air is. That's why I have to measure the density of air. So if we then use this information, we then have a massive error in it. What's more, if we want to then validate our CFD, the validation data is erroneous, which means that the CFD will be erroneous too. So that's why the Atmosphere Hawk is a game changer and we need it. Link in the description for that. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace out, amigos.